we do a lot of things in life to kind of do what good people should do. And so my goal is to at least disrupt that a little bit and have people like take a moment to go, why do I really believe that? Having people to question their beliefs about what they think they know, it's a really positive thing because we don't as humans question our beliefs enough. We just kind of go with the group thing. Hello and welcome to At The Podium with me, Patrick Huey. At The Podium is a multimedia platform where story by story, we explore the resiliency of the human spirit with people who are using their own personal journeys to leave a positive and transformative imprint on our world today. At The Podium holds a space for meaningful conversation, inspiration, and life. Today, I'm thrilled to share the podium with Yogi Aaron. Yogi Aaron is a trailblazing yoga teacher who is leading a global rebellion against what he refers to as the harmful practices of stretching. He pioneered his groundbreaking approach to yoga that shows people how to live pain-free by activating muscles through applied yoga anatomy muscle activation. In a world where conventional stretching and flexibility practices are the prescribed norm for pain, Yogi Aaron's unorthodox method provides what he calls a safer and more effective permanent solution. Whether at his scenic Blue Osa yoga retreat in Costa Rica or through his online Ayama certification program and the Yogi Club, Yogi Aaron is dedicated to teaching students worldwide to break free from pain and unlock their full potential and life purpose. What sets him apart is his personal healing journey, which distinguishes him as a beloved leader in the yoga community. Yogi Aaron, welcome to At The Podium. Thank you so much for having me on here. I'm so honored. Thank you. I, I'm so glad that we were able to make this happen. I have so many questions for you <laughs> and what you're doing in, in your current life, what you've done previously in the world of yoga. I wanted to start with your book, Stop Stretching, A New Yogic Approach to Master Your Body and Live Pain-Free. And in the book you write, here's what I want you to remember. Yoga has absolutely nothing to do with stretching and everything to do with stability. Stability of both the body and the mind. I don't care if you can't touch your toes or bend your torso in half. I'm more interested in your ability to calm your thoughts so you can tap into what truly matters, your soul's purpose. And I wanted to start there because in your in your teachings and in your practice, you've come out pretty strongly against stretching as what's on your t-shirt there. And you say that you're leading a global rebellion against it and you call it harmful. So I really want to know what do you see as harmful about stretching and do you have medical or scientific evidence to support your perspective on that? There's so much to unpack. Start unpacking. You, you, yeah, you kind of went started off with that beautiful quote. And part of the whole stop stretching movement is double-edged. So there's like a lot going on in that statement, stop stretching. And one of the words I like to use is flipping the script. So mm -hmm. when you ask most people, what is yoga? They're going to respond by saying it's stretching. Uh, a lot of people think that people who are more flexible are quote unquote better yogis. I would actually argue that the people that were, are more flexible are less stable and being less stable um, has a lot of ramifications to it. Mm -hmm. So, so it's kind of an interesting sort of, uh, you, let's use the word judgment. It's an interesting judgment to hold like, oh, you're more flexible. Therefore you're a better yogi. It's like, what is yoga? So yoga, I mean, we look at somebody like Gandhi. Gandhi was an incredible yogi. As far as I know, he never practiced any kind of stretching or asana, <laughs> you know, right. but he did a lot of other stuff that most yoga people would never do. 
you know, and to make himself a better yogi. So it's kind of interesting. That's part of the whole flipping the script. It's like, we need to reclaim what yoga is really about, which is the uncovering and tapping into what is the purpose of our life and, and helping us to become the best version of ourself. Mm -hmm. And I can promise you that learning to put your foot behind your head is not going to lead you to becoming the best version of yourself. All you're going to end up doing is probably a injuring yourself and b developing a huge ego, which is the complete antithesis of what yoga is supposed to be about. You talk about in the, the focus on stretching, you, you say that the stretching isn't the thing that it can actually cause more damage to your body that you want to focus more on stability mm -hmm. and how the muscles are working to support yeah. the, the, the the skeleton of the body. And you, you've you had your own personal journey with yeah. the pain that's caused by stretching, overstretching. Are you, are you leading this global rebellion because you want to highlight what the true yogic experience is about? Or are you really talking about a structural change that people need to think about as they're practicing yoga or doing any kind of sport that really leans heavily into stretching? Both, okay. um, both, because we, we, like I said, you know, most people think about yoga and stretching synonymously. And in, in the yoga world, in the yoga scriptures, if we look at all the scriptures, the Bhagavad Gita, the Ramayana, the, um, the Bhairava Tantra, I mean, I could go down the list. There's not one mention, not one of the words stretching or flexibility or mm -hmm saying like you have to be flexible. So there's that. And I also kind of want to come back to your very first question, because I think it's a really important one about the science behind it. And so a lot of people make up a lot of pseudoscience. And, mm -hmm. and let me give you an example of that. Uh, one of the biggest examples that we can pull through, and you don't just see this problem in the yoga world, you see it actually now, you know, gone into all other places. And it's this terminology of opening your hips, yes, or releasing your hips, there is nothing biomechanical, or, or, you know, scientific around this idea of releasing your hips or opening your hips. And one of my jokes that I often make is like, if you could just kind of like, zoom out 40,000 feet up, and kind of look down at this statement, opening your hips. What it really means is like, you're going to end up with dislocated hips and which is not how I think we want to, you know, well, we won't be able to walk through life because our hips are dislocated. That, that'd be a problem. That'd be a big problem. So a lot of what I do is based and steeped in science. And so what we know is that there's like this telephone line called your nerves, your nervous system, uh, between your brain and your muscles. And so they're communicating back and forth, or they should be communicating mm. uh, back and forth when we stretch. So between that communication system, one of the things that's going on is an accountability checklist. The muscle is basically saying, we can only go and stretch, let's use the word stretch this far, and we can only contract or shorten this much. So that this is called proprioception. When we stretch, what we're basically doing is cutting that line of communication because we're forcing a muscle to exceed what it can do. We're forcing a muscle to lengthen beyond its capacity. And as soon as you do that, you basically disconnect that communication system and it just stops cold turkey. Again, I can get more into the science of it if you want, but one of the things that I do want to say to you, Patrick, is like, if you were with me, I could test your muscle strength. Now, if your muscles were testing weak, I could get those muscles strong. And there's a couple of ways that we can do that. But I can come back and test that muscle strength. And you're going to feel those muscles have basically turned on, meaning that we've refortified that communication system. Now, if we refortified it, and I got you to stretch, uh, did a stretch, that communication system would be immediately cut and you would feel, and we can test it. Again, we can test it. We can see if the muscle is working or not, but you would feel not only the muscle turned off, but you would feel less strength than when we first tested it. And so stretching leaves you always weaker than when you first started.
So how did we end up in our lexicon of health and wellness and flexibility and stretching and all of that? How did we get there? Because if it's not how we're actually neurologically and physiologically built, how did we get so invested in this idea of stretching, stretching, stretching? The most simplest def way I can say this, and then I'm going to give you a couple of other reasons, but the most simplest uh, explanation I have is just groupthink. You know, people just start following other people. And I kind of, I blame a couple of people, but one of them is Madonna. <laughs> so, Poor Madonna. I'm she gonna, can't You're going to get brain. a lot of emails from people that Yogi Hair and Reagan on Madonna. No, I'm actually, I love Madonna. Um, but she, when she got into yoga and she actually did a movie, I don't remember the name of the movie, but she actually, in the beginning of the movie, she, you can see her teaching yoga. She was really into yoga. I think she still is. And, you know, and she actually integrated some of it into some of her acts, uh, as you know, in some of her tours. And so what do we as Madonna fans, I'm a Madonna fan, by the way, just for the record. So also and don't so come after do, you. Don't come yeah, after all the Madonna fans. Please don't fans. come after me. I love Madonna. Um, and don't come after me if you don't like Madonna, please. <laughs> but what do we do as fans? We want to emulate, you know, our heroes, our idols, or those people that we follow. And so we don't really question things. And so that's one explanation I have. It's just kind of group think. And so if you ask most people why you should stretch other than you should, um, a lot of people will say, well, it keeps you young, it keeps you more healthy. And so we never again, really question these things. And to be quite honest with you, Patrick, I never question these things, you know, for the, I've been teaching yoga for about 31 years now for the first 25. I was one of those people that said, you should do this, you should do this. So um, it's just one of those things that we just kind of like think we should. And so we learn how to get better at it. You talk about in your own journey um, that you just referenced that the stretching and the way you were practicing yoga was actually really harming you. You were about to have major surgery on your back until you found this gentleman named Eric who started to help you mm -hmm. understand the connection between the, the mind and the muscle. And you also talked about, which I thought was interesting, the idea that we stretch because in the moment it feels good and then an hour, two hours later, your body is, it may be in a less powerful state from mm -hmm. a, a physio physiology perspective than before you stretched. Yeah, I, I, one of the biggest kind of awarenesses that I had, it was one of, I had a few light bulb moments, but one of them was with Eric. It was shortly after I ended up in the hospital and I did not get the spinal fusion. I, after 25 years of practicing yoga and doing yoga, and when I say yoga, I mean stretching. So I should really say stretching. Mm -hmm. After 25 years of doing stretching um, and doing long holds and deep holds and short, hold, every kind of hold to try and deal with my pain, I ended up in the hospital with an orthopedic surgeon saying I might need a spinal fusion. They actually did have to do a little procedure. It's basically the simple explanation is just putting an injection of uh, anti-inflammatories into my lower back, uh, into the spine, literally, because it was just a severe uh, inflammatory issue. I ended up going to visit Eric, who is a muscle activation um, specialist. He did this thing where he got all of my hip flexors strong. Then he passively stretched me and came back and he, the hip flexors tested weak. Mm. And I was like, what did you just do? And he goes, well, before I turned it on and now I turned it off. And I was like, how can you turn on and off a muscle? And what was shocking to me was the way that he turned off my hip flexors is an adjustment that I did a lot. And for the record, most yoga teachers do to their students. And I realized then and there, I, first of all, I'm never going to do that adjustment again. I'm never going to touch students again um, and, or, or move them passively. Mm -hmm. And I also realized I'm never going to teach stretching again. So when you when you say that say that you wouldn't do that to a student again in their in your practice with them, was that student disappointed that they weren't being stretched or pushed past their sort of natural flexibility? Was how did you educate people about this is not going to be the yoga you're probably used to, where there's lots of stretching and 
holding poses for long periods of time, et cetera. How was the market ready to even receive that kind of message? From <laughs> well, I, you know, there's some people who are all about postures and getting the shapes. And so those kinds of people will never be my students. But there's a good solid 30 to 50% of yoga people out there. And, and by the way, for the record, there's more than 50 million people practicing yoga in the US. So I think I have a good group of people to go and talk to, you know? Yeah. I, mean, <laughs> I mean, there's at least 20 to uh, 30 million people looking for what I'm doing. But there's a large group of people that are looking for this, that are in pain. And I don't really start off yoga classes, my yoga classes by saying what we're not going to do. I just teach the way that I teach and, and people love it. People really get into it. Um, now, sometimes some people, especially some, I've had some students get upset because they really want to do the splits or they really want to put their foot behind their head. And my question to them, and it always stops them cold. Why do you want to do that? Is that going to make you a happier person? How much quote unquote flexibility do you need to have to be happy? There's no scientific evidence, nothing saying that in order to be a happier person, you need to be, be more flexible. There's nothing. In fact, what we do find is that the more flexible you are, you're more susceptible to injury. So those are the kinds of people that are, I'm looking to work with or that are looking for someone like me to kind of show them how to improve muscle function mm -hmm. so they have more stability in their body. So muscles have two roles. They move bones and they stabilize joints. And those are kind of two things I'm always telling people, lock into your brain because you're going to hear some crazy stuff out there and always come back to that fact. Muscles move, need to move bones and they stabilize joints. And how do they do that? They need to shorten. Muscles need to shorten in order to do that. They need to be able to contract and contract on demand. And so if they're not able to do that, you're going to end up with instability and instability will always lead to injury um, and pain. So if we can get our muscles working, then we can get, stop that kind of pain cycle. Oh, you're probably making so many people mad right now. I'm just I'm <laughs> laughing. It's, I'm like, oh, they're not liking what you're saying. It, I'm probably making a lot of people mad or some people mad for sure. Because like me, and I can totally identify with this, Patrick, I have a lot of compassion for people that are listening and this is rubbing them the wrong way. Because one of the hard, hardest questions I asked, had to ask myself is, who am I as a yoga teacher if I'm not teaching stretching? Who am I as a yoga person if I'm not able to touch my toes? And so these kind of questions start to challenge our sense of self, our own ego. And, and so if you have a big ego like mine, <laughs> which most people do, then it's, it, these are hard questions to ask. But um, we have to, at the end of the day, say to ourselves, what don't I know? And how can I become stronger? How can I become a more um, stable, enabled, empowered human being so I can go out to live my best life? It's interesting because you talk about that you started practicing yoga at the age of 18 and that you were looking for something to keep you fit, healthy, younger, and that you wanted to, I thought this was interesting, that you wanted to choose practicality over mysticism. You write this. And I wonder, how did, it, how did 18, you walk through this door of yoga? What led you there? First of all, when I started yoga, I wasn't teaching at that moment. I started teaching shortly after that, but I got into yoga because I was so tight, because mm. I equated muscle tightness to getting old, to feeling old. If we look at, you know, the archetypical person who is old, what do you see? Someone who is stiff, hunched over. Yeah you know, doing the shuffle. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. And, and so for me, staying limber was one of the keys to staying young. And so my goal was always to stay limber and to, you know, have a body that worked. 
as I got more and deeper into yoga, one of the things that started happening was my level of concentration improved. Mm -hmm. And I suffered a lot from ADD as a child and uh, right even into my teens and adulthood. What I noticed with yoga was one of the only things that could help me strengthen my power of concentration. And that was what started inspiring me to teach yoga because it helped me so much. I figured it could help so many other people along with a lot of other benefits. And that kind of precipitated me to start studying yoga more and more. So while I got into yoga, going back to your initial comment of like, yeah, I got into it for the practicality part of it rather than the mysticism, the mysticism and spiritual part of it started to grow a lot. I remember when I first met my teacher, Rod, it was like he tore the veil back between the seen and the unseen. He helped me to kind of like penetrate uh, that other world. And once I started doing that, I just got hungry for more and more um, of that. I, I look at how popular yoga has become. Um, mm -hmm. So it, there must be something happening there. And maybe we're just a bunch of vain people and think we're going to look younger, feel better because we can stretch. It, it could be vanity. It really could be vanity. Let's be honest. But I don't think so. I think there's something much deeper going on for people. And I, it was one of my questions actually about pulling back the veil between the self and the sacred. And I wonder if that is what is driving so many people today into the practice of yoga. I feel like a lot of people get into yoga for the same reason I did. They just want to get stretched. They want to you know, be healthier. They want to look younger. You know, their friend Patrick is doing yoga. And so they want to be cool like Patrick or be cool like Madonna. And, <laughs> and so whatever the reason is, you know, namaste, that's great. I'm, I'm happy you've got in the door. I think that a lot of people stay in yoga for various reasons, but I believe in my heart, there was an awakening of consciousness in, in the Yoga Sutras, in Sutra 1-3, Patanjali, the great sage of yoga, says very clearly that when we experience yoga, that there's a deep, unbridled sense of returning home within yourself, being at peace within yourself. And that's a huge statement. And I believe that a lot of yoga people maybe they don't have that pure unbridled sense, but they get a taste of it or they get a glimpse of it. And, you know, who doesn't want to be at home within themselves? Most of my yoga teacher trainings that I have in Costa Rica, my yoga teacher training immersions, we do always a big circle at the beginning. I'm, I don't prompt people. I don't, there's no prompt. There's no question. It's just, the question is, why are you here? That's it. And as I go around the room, it's shocking to me at how many people start off by saying, I don't feel at home in my body. And so I think that when people are doing yoga, they're doing a conscious movement. Uh, they're breathing, they're relaxing. All of these things start to help people feel at peace within themselves. And that is the beginning of yoga. When you can start to feel completely at home and at peace uh, within yourself. In the early 2000s, you started naked yoga in New York. Yes. And I kept, I kept thinking, oh my gosh, I would just be in the class the whole time holding my stomach in. <laughs> hold it in. And but puffing I, your chest. <laughs> puff my chest. Um, I had lots of thoughts about this. And my, my first question was why? Why do we need to be naked to do yoga? And what did you learn about people? Because the minute you start taking, removing all the layers, you're just left with the person. So those are my first two questions. So, Well, I, I started hot new, it was called hot new yoga. And by the way, if you Google it now, I gave up the website. So it probably goes to some porn site. That's not mine. Um, but I started Hot New Yoga because there's a few reasons behind it. I went to an all boys boarding school. And one of my favorite memories was of us going on these canoe trips up into Northern Canada and canoeing. We, canoe trips, by the way, these were like 600 to 900 kilometers long. So it wasn't 
like just, you know, a little jaunt for the weekend. It was like a three week canoe trip. And at the end of the day, oftentimes we would just strip our clothes down and go swimming. Uh, I actually have this one memory of us coming out of this river and we're the very end of this river into this lake called Lake Athabasca. And there was these huge cliffs, um, you know, and all of us kind of like tore our clothes off, climbed up the cliffs and we're cliff jumping. It was so much fun. And what I experienced in that moment was authenticity and just kind of like us boys being boys or men being men. The truth was we were 16, 17 at the time. We were like boys turning into men. And I felt like there was something so powerful in that moment. And what I later came to realize, you know, in my 20s and 30s, looking back at that, there's so much power to just boys hanging out with boys and um, men being with men in a very kind of raw and authentic state. So put a pin in that. Uh, then I moved to Vancouver and one of my favorite places to hang out was a place called Rec Beach, which is probably one of the most famous nudist beaches in the world. I just really loved it. And then I started working in a nightclub and I was a waiter and a go-go dancer in a gay bar. And I <laughs> was... All the look, lives. I can remember, All there's the so lives. much to unpack. But I realized I had this kind of like awareness of wouldn't it be cool if we weren't doing this in a bar, that we were naked, and there was sort of some activity behind it, and it was a non-sexual environment. Wouldn't that be really cool? What would that be like? Okay, put all those things together. I end up in New York City, and I was thinking of a kind of a yoga class that would be cool catch people's attention and something that was close to my heart. And then I remember the day it happened. I was walking across Sixth Avenue at 23rd Street. And it was like the sun, you know, shining down on my forehead. And I had this like name pop into my head, hot new yoga. And that was kind of like the start of it. What I kind of observed. And so when I started hot new yoga, I thought it's going to last six months. You know, it'll be six months and I'll do something else. Well, 10 years later, <laughs> you know, and, and this worldwide phenomena, I remember six months shortly after we started, uh, Time Out New York came and did a piece uh, with us. His name was Les, us, and he called us an underground sensation. Mm -hmm. And and I kind of bit, wear that as a badge of honor, you know, to this day still. But what I started to notice was what I was hoping and in endeavoring to create was this real connection. You know, men sincerely connecting with men in a very kind of raw and authentic way that wasn't sexual, that was non-sexual, that was just very heart-centered. And, you know, a lot of those connections, I keep in touch obviously with a lot of people. So it's the connections that people made were so heart-centered that for a lot of them, they still keep in touch. They And those connections are just as real today as they were uh, back then. So the word you used was so potent. It was authentic. So many of us hide behind our clothes. You know, I, I look in the yoga world, how many people hide behind their Lululemon or their stop stretching shirts. And so, <laughs> you know, we hide behind our clothes. And one of the things that I found, I didn't know my students that well. I only know, knew how they presented when they showed up. Sometimes after people would show up for six months, a year, sometimes even two years, I would actually then find out, oh, they're a Wall Street banker. Oh, they're a starving artist in the village. You yeah. know, I didn't know their story, all I knew was how they presented. And that's the power of showing up nude is that this is who I am. And we, you know, without my story. And that mm. I think is just really potent. This is who I am without my story. Oh, wow. Yeah. You know, it's interesting that you talk about that experience when you were in high school or college, I can't recall, and you're on those cliffs in Vancouver and you're with all the guys and you're naked jumping off the cliff and all of that. And it's interesting because now I, I notice there's been a proliferation of all of these different retreats 
for men to go together to the woods or to the beach or wherever and to just be together. And it has nothing to do with sex because most of these groups are not run by gay men or as far as I know, gay men, bi men, whatever. But it's about, there's something that happens because so much in our world has pushed against that kind of connection between men. And now it's it feels like it's really acute that we as men find places to be together where we can be vulnerable with each other. I think it's a really interesting, and maybe you were sort of on the front end of this curve with naked yoga, nude yoga, nude hot yoga. There's something there, I think, that's really interesting that, I, I guess because women do this naturally, or, or, or women give each other the permission to be close and connected. I think we're finally figuring out as, as men that we need to have those types of important relationships and showing up without our stories yeah. to be more outside of pain be it physical or emotional. I'm wondering if you would talk about, I, I was reading your story and when you talked about your experience in the Himalayas, when your, when your leg literally snapped the femur, <laughs> I was like, if that is not a message, <laughs> I was like, A, how did you get out of that hike on the Himalayas? What did you take away from that experience? Because a theme that has emerged this season on the show is that we we have to be broken to be healed and for the light to shine through. So I'm wondering what that experience on the Himalayan mountains gave you. It that was a moment. That was a very pivotal moment when I was on the in the Himalayas that year. It was 2007. I just turned 35. I had just found Blue Osa. Uh, which is the yoga retreat I opened in Costa Rica. And I also was starting to accelerate my career, if you want to say, use that word as a teacher. I had actually been invited to this men's group. And it was a it was a travel group and they, you know, they did different journeys and that sort of thing. And there was a moment in that retreat where a few, not a lot, it was actually a very small group, like five people really got angry with me. So that kind of like really shook me uh, because it called into question, you know, who am I as a teacher? And, you know, and, and I'm opening up this retreat center and all of this stuff, and I'm, I'm about to go to India. And it really kind of shook me to my core. And the word came up, and this, this is a word that came up after that Himalayan experience, accountability. And I'm going to kind of circle back to that in a moment, because the reason why they got angry with me is because, you know, I was just, teaching yoga, teaching people, you know, how to move their bodies safely. But a lot of people don't, you know, it's really hard for a lot of people to get into their bodies. If we, once we get into our bodies, for some people, it can be very um, awakening and not yes. in a pleasant way because we have yes. to deal with ourselves. You know, we have to, once we confront ourselves, we have to deal with ourselves. And so I kind of like left on very shaky ground you know, my own confidence had gone down a lot at that moment. And it was good. It was a trial by fire moment. And um, the group leaders who were part of Spirit Journeys kind of like read me the riot act and this sort of thing. And, you know, it just kind of really shook me. So then the situation happened. Literally, Patrick, it was about a month later. I'm on the Himalayas. A boulder, you know, twice the size of a bowling ball came down and hit my femur bone broke it in half and i'm 26 kilometers away from help oh and i thought this is how i'm going down you know with this group of people angry at me and you know my legacy and blah 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 but you know one of my teachers who taught me how to deal with things in life said if you're going to be a mess be a happy mess and right away that kind of like observing myself in this situation and how ridiculous it was how ridiculous i'm in the Himalayan mountains me yogi aaron you know <laughs> how dare you you know shiva uh do this to me and the reason why i say shiva is because that was actually the abode one of the abodes of shiva there is a mountain there that represents Shiva. And I thought, how dare you, Shiva, throw this boulder at me? Do you know who I am? <laughs> so the, 
it was there was a lot of things going through my mind but one of them was you know if you're going to be a mess be a happy mess you know what else can i do but that attitude gave me the personal empowerment let's say to have the clarity of deciding how do i want to choose to be in this moment because mm -hmm. i not, i couldn't move you know there's nothing i could do the the short story is to ask your answer your question how i got off the mountain um, eventually, we realized that professional help was not coming. And so, but a group of porters came up, uh, I guess they were sent up, and they basically carried me down 26 kilometers. It was quite a journey. And most of that journey was done in the pitch black. You know, by the time we started making our way off the glacier, it was about 3.30 in the afternoon. And so by the time we hit the major part of the trail, it was pitch black. The only light we had was people, you know, holding their headlamps. Um, and I'm being carried on this kind of like thing called a dandy, mm -hmm. and which is like a chair um, with poles that four people are carrying. And all that way down, I just had a couple of thoughts. One, obviously, you know, if you're going to be a mess, be a happy mess. Two, I had my yogic breath. And three, I carried faith. You know, faith was the only, the only other thing I had. Faith that I would get to the end. Faith that whatever was going to be was going to be. It was out of my hands. You know, there, there's nothing else that I could have done in that moment. And so it was three and a half days from getting hit by that boulder to when I had surgery. It took me a long time to get to the hospital. On the way, once we finally got to the ambulances, which looked like something that came out of a 50s uh, Flintstone movie, um, there was a landslide that we got stuck at for the following 12 hours. So it was just like one thing after another thing. And the only thing I had in that moment was my breath and my faith and uh, knowing that where I was in this moment was where I was supposed to be. So just stay present to it. But that idea of, you know, being accountable, like there's nowhere else I could be except for here. And I think that when we accept accountability for our, our situation in the moment and in that phrase, if you're going to be a mess, be a happy mess, really supported me to stay present and be accountable for what was happening to me and know that I have choice in how I'm going to respond uh, to the situation. So that's kind of how it made me a stronger person to kind of always have in my mind that, that I have a choice in this moment. Those people who carried you down, how do you even begin to thank them for that? It's a really, I, I mean, you know, that experience made me see angels everywhere mm -hmm. for months afterwards. You know, those four, pe four people that carried me down, the people that were behind them to make sure that the trail was lit up, the students that were with me that supported me. Um, obviously, the retreat had to keep going. <clears throat> and so there was people in that retreat that kind of took over my role and just stepped up immediately, you know, uh, to the doctor that operated on me to, you know, the steward, the flight attendants that helped me you know, I remember coming through us customs. Ironically, there was an Indian man, uh, helping me. And I remember him just looking at me with such compassion and such love and i maybe that was just my you know my perception of seeing everybody as angels but i just everybody was just so kind and had so much grace it, to this day it still touches my spirit mm -hmm. and all i can do at this moment is just try and pay it forward that's what i endeavor to do as best as i can i probably wasn't so much of a compassionate person before then i was what you would characterize as a bit of an A-type personality, uh, you know, get off your ass kind of person, make your life happen. I think that having a boulder thrown at me by Shiva um, made me definitely a bit more compassionate and more understanding. Um, and that's something that has just grown since that experience. And I think has made me a better teacher for it. Wow. 
you know, when I listen to your story, your your whole story from 18, finding yoga to understanding how your body works and all the things that you built and done and experienced, do you, do you feel comfortable with the idea that you are a disruptor? That's an interesting question because I never considered myself that archetype before until I started writing my book. I actually think it was about a year after I wrote Stop Stretching that I realized I am a trailblazer and started to own it and that I am, you know, a disruptor. And, but I, I endeavored to do it in a positive way having people to question their beliefs about what they think they know. It's a really positive thing because we don't as humans question our beliefs enough. We just kind of go with the group think and we, we, we like, you know, so many of our beliefs are like doilies, little face doilies that we wear our Another word that we could use are person, personalities. Um, the Greek root word personality is, is persona. And the word persona means masks. So we wear so many masks or personalities that are designed to please other people, to go along with the group thing. We do a lot of things in life to kind of be do what good people should do. And so my goal is to at least disrupt that a little bit and have people like take a moment to go, why do I really believe that? Um, in yoga, there's this teaching where Patanjali introduces this idea of sankalpa versus vikalpa. And in short, sankalpa are those beliefs, those stories that really support us in life, that really help us to manifest and live our life purpose. Our V culpas are those stories, attitudes, judgments, and beliefs that really keep us down in the muck. And so my goal is to have people like, just take, take a moment to kind of like, think about that. And just for your listeners to understand, I never personally judge, and I'm not here to judge what a person's beliefs, attitudes, and opinions are. That's what yoga does is it helps us to bring awareness to those things. And you as the practitioner or me as the practitioner, I have to look at my own stories and go, is that really a story I want to keep? <laughs> or do I choose to let it go? Ooh. Is that a story I want to keep? Wow. Yeah. So is that going back to your question about stretching and disrupting, like, is stretching a really a story I want to keep? Well, I can tell you one thing. When I ended up in the surgeon's, you know, emergency room with a surgeon telling me you're going to need a spinal fusion, that was a big wake up call. And clearly the story that I had been telling myself for the previous 25 years, not working. And mm. I had to own that. And I had to wake up to that. So on this season of the show, we are talking about people and the legacies that they leave. How, whatever that means for you. And I'm curious what you believe your legacy is or will be. I think that my first legacy, just kind of objectively kind of looking outwards is reminding people to laugh more in life. That's, I think the biggest compliment people give to me is, you know, people always say they know when I'm around because they can hear me laughing. <laughs> and so, so that's like, a, that's so important that we remind ourselves just to laugh. And Mark Victor Hansen taught me that when, when problems in life happen, learn to laugh at them. Because when we laugh, what do problems do? They get smaller, they, can, they, they shrink. And so as soon as we can start to laugh, and I think that laughing at problems remind us of the ridiculousness of you know how kind of petty life can be sometimes. And so in that, if we can look at our problems as petty, we remind ourselves that we're bigger than that. And we are bigger than that. So laughter gets us into our, our biggest state. My, I hope that my legacy is to remind people to live authentically. And that's where our real power lies is mm -hmm. when we're just being ourselves. Mm. Yogi Aaron, thank you so much for your time today. Um, was not the conversation I was expecting to have. So 
I, I love that. I love that. That makes two of us. <laughs> <laughs> Good. We're both surprised. But I thank you so much for your your time and your wisdom and your willingness to sort of go there around the idea of rewiring how we think about things. So I appreciate mm -hmm. that very, very much. And to those of you who are watching or listening, remember, we all have a voice. We all will leave a legacy. So what story do you want to tell? Bye, everyone. <laughs>